Welcome to the Oasis. We are glad you're here this morning. We begin a new sermon series entitled Ask the Pastor. And uh, I want this to be a kind of an interactive sermon and, and, uh, because there are probably questions that you'd like to ask God someday, right? I hope that day is a long way off for you to get that chance, but now is the time to ask questions. We're going to have like field questions. There's a thing in your bulletin where you can ask questions that you might be curious about that, hey, I'd like to ask God that. And we have been, uh, you've been able to email the office and we're going to incorporate texting today and uh, we'll figure out what we can do with that. But if you want to have a text up there, I think we had our, the number up there earlier and maybe you've missed that, but we'll go on with that. But if you text a question, We'll be able to do that as well. And we're going to take questions for the next several weeks. We're going to take Ask the Pastor questions. And, and probably if, if we answered every question, we'd be having this series up into next year sometime. So what I want to try to do is to group some of these groupings together with some similar questions and, and hope that they kind of make sense when we flesh those out. And I want you to remember this. There are no stupid questions. There are only stupid answers. And I hope that's true for this sermon series as well. Um, I want to tell you a story that happened a couple of months ago now. There was uh, somebody came to me from the church and they said, hey, did you get that information that so-and-so gave you before service a couple of weeks ago? And I said, well, nobody gave me anything before service a couple of weeks ago. What do you mean? And they said, well, somebody from the Pueblo West Church of Christ came and they gave you, they handed you some VBS materials. And uh, in, a, in a few weeks uh, in August, the Oasis is teaming up with the Pueblo West Church of Christ and we're going to do a VBS, a vacation Bible school for the kids together. But somebody said that they came and gave me some information. Well, before service sometimes, I don't know what I say, so I don't know what my interaction is with you guys because I'm kind of focused on the message sometimes and I know I miss things like that. And I, So I checked to see where the VBS material might be. A couple of weeks later, this guy, Dave, come, hello, I answered the phone at the church office and it was Dave Gingrich. And he said, Greg, where's that VBS material I gave you? I said, Dave, I have no recollection of that. I said, can you, what did the, what did the packet look like? And he said, well, I think it was a three ring binder. It said VBS right there on it. I said, well, can you describe kind of that morning when you came in, what that was like to refresh my memory? He said, well, I came in, it was really early, came into the cafeteria and I looked over and you were sitting there with two other guys drinking coffee. And I said, well, all right. He said, I walked over and handed it right to you. I said, Dave, I have no clue of what you're talking. And I'm not on any medication right now either. I mean, I'm, I'm clean. I, I don't know. I said, but I'll check. And I went back, checked through my office again. I came to church, uh, came in the cafeteria the next Sunday, and I went over to the connecting point here. And I thought, you know, sometimes I set stuff there when people hands me stuff. And I looked through there, and I had this image in my mind. And I turned around and did this double take, and there were three guys sitting on the couch by the window. And I walked over, and I said to those guys, did anybody hand you something that was from the Pueblo West Church of Christ a couple of weeks ago? Will Gray, one of our elders, <laughs> said, yes, Dave Gingrich was in there, and he handed me a thing. And I thought about it. For, I said, Will, Dave thinks you're me. And we got, we got a good laugh about that and uh, kind of got that figured out. But Dave Gingrich was so certain of his opinion that, Greg, no, I gave that stuff to you. And this is my point. My point's this. When you strongly have an opinion on something, it doesn't matter what information comes in or what kind of other facts come in. I mean, you're dead set on that information. And usually what you do is you start gathering other information just to reinforce your opinion no matter how wrong it might be. In this Ask the Pastor series, I might address some t topics that you have strong opinions about and I want you to be able to have an open mind because I want God's Word to reflect on maybe your opinion and maybe His Word can bring more information into the situation in your mind even if your mind's already made up. But it's my prayer through this series that you will examine the counsel of God when we're going to some of these issues that a lot of people have strong opinions about. And this is kind of the, the verse for this sermon series. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 is kind of our main theme. It's, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, I read in the newspaper that it said this, that uh, Americans believe in God 
but they do not necessarily go to church, they do not necessarily think the Bible's accurate, nor do they worry about theological consistency, and they tend to be biblically illiterate. And then it went on to say that 8 out of 10 people believe the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. And 8 out of 10 people believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. But it, it's, it said that one in four have moved closer to an experiential interpretation of scriptures, researchers conclude. And that tells me today there are a lot of people that are fashioning a God out of their own mind. They're creating a God out of their own opinion. And it may or may not be right. And I hope this is a forum where you'll be able to ask some of those questions that will help you solidify what the Bible says and reinforce your opinions. And more importantly, that it will draw us closer to God and what His Word says in us. Because if your belief in Christ is not really built on the solid foundation of Scripture, it's not going to hold pressure. It's not going to hold water when the pressure of the world comes against you. And more importantly, in the end of time when that someday occurs, it's not going to be enough if you've got a skewed view of the Bible and, and Jesus Christ. It's not going to be enough to get you into heaven. So I hope that this will be a sermon series that will benefit every person. And it'll be kind of interactive. You know the custom is I stand up here. And you guys listen very intently. And, and we have bulletins. And on the back, I know you're filling those things out and taking notes. And I know some of you are writing a to-do list. <laughs> and even with this interactive sermon, you probably have your smartphones out. And, and I know you might not be texting, you might be checking the weather, but that's okay. You can do that throughout this sermon series, and I think it'll be hopefully a lot of fun. Today I want to begin with a biblical reason for why we're doing that, why, why I want to do this series, and, instead of, uh, and then at the end come in and answer some of those questions, hopefully, that, that the congregation has had. But G Jesus' sermons were often interactive. Jesus' sermons were on, uh, often interactive. I want to look in... Uh, uh, the third gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke chapter 4. And uh, I want to read our primary text is from Luke chapter 4 in this first section today. But I want to look at the interactive sermons of Jesus. Jesus went to Galilee, it tells here, and then into Nazareth. And on the Sabbath day, uh, when he began his ministry, he would go into the synagogues and he would teach. And the Bible says this in Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee... And the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. And the Bible says that after Jesus got baptized, that he, he began his ministry. Uh, he went into the wilderness, tempted by Satan. He, he left all that, and he started his ministry. And the Bible says he went to Galilee. That's where he first began. It says he taught there. And then the scripture here says that he went on to Nazareth. But in Galilee, it says that everyone praised him in this verse. The, uh, everyone praised him because he had this innovative teaching. And there was a commentator, William Barclay, who wrote about this. It said that the people saw Jesus' teaching as fresh and new, and they really responded to that. But then Jesus went from the region of Galilee to, to Nazareth. Nazareth is where Jesus grew up as a carpenter. It's where he began his trade. And he wasn't received very well there. Verse 16 of our text goes on to say that he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Now, the synagogue was the center of teaching in that day. Um, the temple was located in Jerusalem, and that's where they would go make sacrifices. But it was in the synagogue that weekly that the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, would get their teaching from scriptures. And uh, they would do that on the Sabbath. And, and the Jewish law said that wherever there were ten families, there needed to be a synagogue. So in every town of, of these families, there would be this synagogue where they would go on the Sabbath on Saturday for their teaching. And here on the Sabbath on Saturday... Jesus took ex advantage of that open forum in the, in the synagogue setting. In verse 20 of our text, uh, chapter 4, goes on to read this, that he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So after the scripture reading... Jesus sat down to entertain the audience, and it was an interactive sermon. Now, in the synagogue, the way that they worshipped, 
there were these procedures that, that they engaged in as well when they practiced worship. One, uh, one was that they gathered together and they prayed together. Then secondly, they would read scripture together. They would open up the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and they would have seven people, seven different people reading. And it was all volunteer. And I mean, can you imagine standing up and, and saying of this audience, we wanted seven people to read a section of scripture every week. And, and we would say, hey, does, does anybody want to read? And you might get two or three people to come up here. But when Jesus was afforded that opportunity, you know, he took advantage of that. He was beginning his ministry and he said, you know, hey, I'll do that. And the attendant probably said, yeah, come on up and read. Now, the third part of their worship in the synagogue was the teaching segment. After prayer, after scripture, the, the attendant or the president of the synagogue would get up and would invite, if they had any distinguished guests, to come up and speak, to, to lecture, to talk about the Bible, or ask for volunteers. And we read here that Jesus read from Isaiah chapter 61, and he read that from the scroll, and he sat down. Now, he didn't sit down because he was finished. He sat down because he was just about to begin. And they had this interactive sermon during Jesus' day, and he would be seated like the rabbis often taught in Jesus' day as well. They would remain seated when, when they would teach, and uh, they, would, they would speak and have this interactive situation. Now, the second point I want to note about Jesus' teaching is that Jesus' style was sometimes inflammatory. It was sometimes inflammatory. The people in Galilee who didn't know him very well, they enjoyed his teaching, but where he grew up, the people in Nazareth, they did not enjoy Jesus' teaching. Uh, chapter 4, verse 28 says this. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Now what they had heard was Jesus was talking favorably about the Gentiles whom the Hebrews hated. And it says in verse 29, they got up and drove him, drove Jesus, and we get this scene, out of the town. They took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to, th listen, to, to throw him down the cliff. They were furious about what Jesus was teaching in their synagogue. And when you teach about the Bible, especially when you teach on subject matters that people have high, strong opinions about and they don't like it, they're going to get angry. And sometimes they run off the preacher. And sometimes they never return. I've been in ministry nearly 20 years, two decades. And I have heard story after story of where somebody's left church because something that a pastor or an elder said never to return. And I want you to know that during this Ask the Pastor series, that if you disagree with something that I say and you drag me out to the brow of the hill, I hope that we can have some type of arrangement before somebody gets hurt. It'll probably be me <laughs> that gets hurt. But often in Scripture, Jesus was brutally honest. I mean, he, he pointed to the religious leaders and said, you whitewashed tombs, you brood of vipers. And, and the religious leaders wanted to kill him. And eventually, they killed him. But what it boils down to is this. Where do we get our authority as individuals? Where do we come up with our opinions? Is it really based in the Word of God? Or is it through some other means? So in this series, I want to deal with theological and doctrinal and Bible subjects, but some of the questions people ask, they're not even addressed in Scripture. So, I mean, it's, it's easy when the Bible speaks directly to a subject, but when the Bible doesn't speak directly to an issue, uh, it's difficult to find out. And I tell you what, this church, this is what we're about here. When the Bible speaks directly on an issue, we stand up for that even if it's unpopular, even if it's not politically correct, because that's what we need to do as a church and as a leadership leading in Scripture. But when it's vague, when a subject does not directly speak to, to, to a yes or no, this is right or wrong, we've got to develop some strong ideals based on what Scripture says. So some of the questions that I want to deal with today that I've lumped together is, is some subjects is not directly touched on in Scripture. And I know there's some people here today who have some very strong opinions on these subjects. But when the Bible says little, we have to formulate good ones. And what I want to do is to look first at how we get our views shaped. We call it our worldview. How is it that we've reached the conclusions that we've reached about a, a variety of subjects? And then 
how can we use Scripture to support those beliefs? And I think there are a number of ways we develop our opinions. And one way that we develop our opinions is by the authority of culture. People take polls, and they take those polls, and they reach an agreement, and they go, you know what, I, I agree with that. Majority rules. I want to go with the public opinion on that. And that's the way a lot of people make their decision and form their opinions. They just go with what's popular out there. But the Bible warns this. Listen to this. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism. But for many people, that's how their worldview is formed. It is shaped by the culture, what's most popular. And we take sides with the loudest, the most popular. But we're not to do that, Scripture says. There's also then the authority of tradition. There are other people that develop their opinions because we've always done it that way. And since we've always done it that way, it must be right. And they say, you know, I just always grew up believing that. I mean, isn't that the way it's supposed to be? And their beliefs and their values are shaped by how they grew up and the traditions that they've observed in the past. Oftentimes, when that happens, and then they come to a Bible subject that's really not addressed specifically, a person with their opinion will go to Scripture and they'll pick and choose parts of verses just to add up to reinforce their opinion. And they typically take a lot out of context sometimes. Jesus was very harsh to the people who did that in the first century. In fact, he said this to the religious leaders in Matthew 15. Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? And he rebuked the spiritual leaders of that day for elevating their opinions, their traditions over the word of God. It's nothing new. Then there's the authority of reason. With this worldview, people will form, they, they form their opinions based on their own intellect. And they say, you know, if it's logical, if I think that that's right, that's just the way that it is. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the facts say. I don't care what the other information says. And they use their own intellect to make their opinions valid as if it's the right decision. The Bible says this, there's a way that seems right, but in, in the end it leads to death. And personal reason gets elevated above fact. Then there's the authority of personal feelings. Now I think in our culture this is probably one where it's more common today in, in the era in which we live, this personal feelings. Personal feelings have gotten elevated as the final truth above all. It trumps reason, it trumps facts, it trumps logic, and people will say, you know, I just believe this because it's the way I feel. I don't care what's said about it. And the truth becomes irrelevant. And some have formed some very strong opinions based on what their gut tells them, and it's so dangerous. And all of these, if your worldview is shaped by culture, tradition, reason, your feelings, your mind could become closed to the counsel of God. Now, we're going to look at some examples. Uh, they're going to be a little bit sensitive, I think, and so I just kind of want to lay down some ground rules for that. And uh, the one is, is that I want you to know it's okay if we disagree. Uh, when it's a matter of opinion, it doesn't matter in the end if somebody's right or somebody's wrong. So I think we need to be flexible in giving somebody the allowance to be wrong. If they want to be wrong, that's okay, isn't it? So let's understand if it's opinion that we can give people the flexibility to be wrong. And, and if we're different, we can disagree, and that's okay. The second thing I want to uh, talk about is if there's not a clear yes or no, I should or I shouldn't in Scripture, let's lean toward the side of freedom and flexibility. If we're going to err in conflict with somebody, let's err on the side of flexibility and not be judgmental and legalistic about our opinions as to disassociate with somebody or not. So you asked for it. So here are some questions that uh, I want to talk about today. And I think this first one ought to be kind of interesting. I, I thought it was fun learning about. But here's question number one. Are tattoos a sin? Are tattoos a sin? 
Some of you are thinking, go for it, preacher. Answer that question. A tat, no big deal, is it? You know, others of you know tattoos are wrong and are sinful, don't you? And we probably got that balance in here today. For those of you who believe that tattoos are wrong, that are sinful, what has shaped your view to allow you to reach that conclusion? Well, you probably know that in the Old Testament, there's actually a verse of Scripture that specifically address tattoos, don't you? Uh, Leviticus, 9, Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28, says this. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Now, I don't know if I've seen this many people looking in their Bibles uh, at a verse of Scripture since I've been here. But there it is, isn't it? Pretty clear right there in Scripture. Well, there's this rule of, of Scripture I want to, to share. I'll probably talk about this rule uh, throughout this series, when you're interpreting Scripture, the first rule of thumb is always look at the context. Context means everything. So when you take the meaning of something in Scripture, you've got to first put it and lump it together in the context in which it was written. You just can't pull that out. If you take this tattoo verse in context, in Levit Leviticus 19, what's it say? It, in context, it also forbids people to plant two kinds of seeds in a field. Now, I don't know if anybody's going to get too upset if you plant two <laughs> seeds in a field today. It also says that you're not allowed to wear two types of fabric. I'm wearing two types of fabric up here today, and I've been allowed to preach. Levitic, verse 27 in Leviticus 19, the, the verse right before the tattoo verse says this, Do not cut the hair on the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. There's a lot of you that have disregarded that verse of Scripture in here, isn't it? I mean, I'm looking around, there's some people that have, that have shaved. So the question is, why do we look at verse 28 on tattoos and say, no, no tattoos? In verse 27, and we go, ah, I really don't care about that. I think I'll shave anyway. Could it be that we look to Scripture to just to try and reinforce our opinion because we want something to validate that. I mean, so in context, this verse uh, about tattoos is with planting and it's with cutting your hair. That context had very specific application in that particular instance in which that was written. It was talking about idolatry right there. Now, there are some scriptures that you might think, well, you know what, Greg, there's other scriptures that support that. And you point to the scriptures that say, well, it talks about being wise, and you know tattoos are permanent, and you know if you're a kid and you want to get in a tattoo, and, and uh, you might want to change. I think it's wise not to get a tattoo, and that's kind of reinforced your belief as well. And some of you might use the, the Bible about, well, you know, it's a stumbling block. And that, that's the catch-all. I don't want, to be a, don't want to be a stumbling block to somebody. And that's probably the reason why some people have not gotten tattoos. And that's okay. I mean, some people see tattoos as a sign of rebellion. And that, that's why uh, people not... Now, on the other hand, there are people, there are good Christian Christ followers who have made the determination in their life that tattoos are not a sin. And they've prayed about it. They've got confirmation from God. They can't find anything in Scripture that speaks directly against that in context. And they've gotten tattoos. And they're very meaningful for them. It might mark the day of their conversion. And they know that they've marked that point in time where Jesus Christ has changed their life. And there are others that say it's a good testimony because I'm able to witness with my tattoos. So that's the both sides of the story on that. The scriptures do not prohibit that. 1 Corinthians 10, in the New Testament, I think, this is a great verse of Scripture for us to look at in this type of instance. The Bible says this, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, God has given us certain freedoms in the New Testament that we can abide by. And the bottom line is that we're to do it all for the glory of God. And let me have this admonition. If you're living under your parents' roof, and they don't want you to have a tattoo, then you better listen to them because you're living under their authority. 
And whether it's piercings or whether it's tattoos, you need to listen to them until you get out and you make your own household. Now the second question is this, what's the Bible say about clothing? It's kind of a general question, but I've been asked before, is it okay to wear a bikini down to the beach? Well, there was a lady growing up in my neighborhood that wore her bikini cutting her lawn. <laughs> I gotta laugh about that when I think about it. But, but the Bible doesn't talk about wearing bikinis or not wearing bikinis. But if you look through scripture, there's all these scriptures that talk about dress in general. And it mostly deals with issues of modesty. Now, there's one verse in Timothy 2.9. It says this, I, I also want women to dress modestly. So what's modestly mean? Well, one form of it is that modestly is not to draw attention to yourself. So immodesty is when you wear clothing that draws attention to yourself. And there's, there's other applications of this, but especially when you come to corporate worship, you know, you don't want to dress immodestly and there's flexibility given there and guys I want to go ahead and add something to you since I've said something about women I don't want to see your underwear with your pants kind of hanging down <laughs> a little bit you know pull them up uh, especially when you're in public you can do that at home uh, I did an outdoor wedding once and uh, it was hot that summer and uh, yeah, I was conscientious about you know I wanted to wear whatever they were wearing. I said, hey, uh, you want me to wear my suit? You know, what are you guys wearing? And they said, uh, you know, don't wear your suit, just, just wear a vest. And so I, I got there that day and got out of my car, left my suit coat in the car, and, and walked up to the house and everybody was assembling. Well, the groomsmen walk out of the house and they're just wearing vests. And I mean, they're just wearing vests. <laughs> they didn't have any shirts under the vest. They had, all had tattoos on that they were sporting that they wanted to, to show off. And uh, it, it's unusual about how people dress. But the third uh, question that I want to deal with is, uh, I think it really pertains a lot more uh, to this application, but what do we wear when we go to church? What's the proper attire for worship? A lot of different opinions, a lot of different strong opinions about this subject. And, and you know, we should be concerned about appropriate worship. And on the one hand, when we're in the presence of God, we want to honor Him. I mean, if He's the King of Kings, and if He's the Lord of Lords, I mean, doesn't it follow that we should give Him the highest and proper respect, and we're the very best in His presence? I mean, if you were going to go visit the President of the United States next year, I mean, wouldn't you want to wear your finest? Your finest suit? And your finest clothing? Now, you guys are reading way, way between the lines. I was just checking to see. Now that means nothing. If you went today to see the president, and I, I mean, wouldn't you want to wear your finest? Guys, don't, don't let there be a mass ex. I'm not going to the brow of the hill. Don't leave. I'm, it's, I just, you guys are fast. I mean, you guys are fast. But the president of the United States that position, I mean, he's the president. You want to honor that. You want to uh, dress appropriate for that. Now, you got to think, what if the president was your father? Now, does that mean that every day that when you get up, you need to put on your finest clothing to go approach the president? No, if you're, if you're the president's child, You've got that relationship factor built into that. Do you want to be respectful? Yeah. Do you want to honor? Yeah. But it'd be kind of unusual, wouldn't you think, for the president's child to have to dress up to the, to the nines before they can go speak to their, to their dad, to be in the presence of their father? So the question is, I think that's more appropriate that we need to ask, is how do I relate to God? How is it that I want to relate to God. Does God want us to relate to Him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Absolutely. God wants us to revere Him and hold Him up high. But if you read through the New Testament, the, the figure, the example, the, the, the appropriate term for God is described as Father. More than 150 times in the New Testament, God is called a Father. Now, the Bible goes a step further. 
because I think it wanted to be clear in this aspect, and it uses Aramaic. And when you translate the Aramaic term for father, it means Abba. And Abba does, is not best translated sir. Abba is not best translated father. And Abba is not best translated dad. Abba is best translated daddy. God wants us to approach him. He's our daddy. He wants us to use that intimate family designation. Now, there are many people who want to honor God when they come to corporate worship like today. And if they want to give their best and dress up in their best suit or their best dress, that's okay. If that's how they honor Him, God sees the heart. He's going to honor that. And if that's your heart and that's your motive, God accepts that, I'm sure, as a wonderful act of reverence and worship. But there are others who've chosen to be more casual and come to the Father by saying, Daddy. And if it's their motive to do that and not to do that casually out of a disrespect but out of a, a real reverence, God examines that motive too. And I think He honors that too. And I think He's most concerned about what's on the inside and not what's on the outside. Now, I know there are some of you who are very concerned about dressing up in the presence of God. And you're going to be horrified to find this out that this morning you probably stood before God without any clothing at all. And what I mean by that, we've, we've gotten this impression that this building, this place where we come for corporate worship is church, and we're coming in to the presence of God. But there's really, in a sense, even your bathroom is the holy place of God. Jesus came so that we could be in God's presence everywhere that we went. And what becomes dangerous in our minds is when we think, oh, for that one hour of week, I want to do my very best for God because I'm walking into God's presence. You're in the presence of God if you're a Christian 168 hours a week. This isn't something that you do just one hour a week. And the opinion about dress, you know, it, it takes a lot of turns. I mean, I've wrestled with it in my mind over the years. You know, dressing up's a better witness. You know, it's not going to make... People stumble, you know, especially the preacher. I mean, he's, he's adding something to that, and people look at the, the, the preacher a little bit more differently because of what it communicates. I'm up here communicating. And you know, that makes sense. I can understand that opinion. And as a communicator, I'd never want what I wear to be a stumbling block or a hindrance to somebody that's hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and their eternity can be affected for that. So I'm very conscientious about that but it's very tricky because some people can be reached better when the preacher is is dressed up but more and more and we're learning that the unchurched the unchurched listen more and are more receptive to somebody who's dressed more casually and who are, are dressed like them. So I don't want to be a stumbling block for those people too. Those people, the unchurched right now, one of the things they got against the church is the church is just filled with pretense during that hour and they dress up and they do these things and they're kind of hip, hypocritical. And if they tend to listen better if the minister is dressed down just a little bit, a little more casually dressed like them and they're not going to be so cynical when they hear the gospel message, then wouldn't we want to do that to reach somebody for the cause of Christ. I was going to help testify in court some time ago, and, you know, I, I was just going to wear my suit to court. And uh, I, I talked to the attorney, and I said, you know, should I wear my suit, you know, when I come? And she said, oh, no. Uh, they'll think you're, you're a lawyer, you know. Don't wear a suit to court. And uh, even in sales today, they're dressing more Casual because you see a guy dressed up in a three-piece suit and he's coming into a client You know what the client thinks high-pressure sale here comes that guy with a suit and There's some people that feel that way when the minister walks in With a suit also. I mean even in the medical field. There's the white coat syndrome. I mean Statistically, I mean some doctors are, are wearing casual clothes because they've done research that shows that when the doctor walks in with his white coat on their blood pressure a patient's blood pressure gets elevated I mean can you believe that <laughs> yeah I know some of you none of this makes sense 
but there are a lot of people uh, who get this way around a minister too. My brother-in-law was a police officer for decades and, and he used to say whenever he and I would walk in a room together, he said everybody would hang their head low because he's a cop and I'm a minister and everybody felt guilty about something. <laughs> and if I can dress in a way to help preach the gospel, you know, I want to do that. Uh, there, there's really no place in Scripture where Jesus talks about the dress code except for one place. And I don't have it on the screen, but it's Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. And what he addresses there is the religious leaders. And he really condemns them for dressing to the nines and making their phylacteries big and their tassels long. And they set themselves apart by their dress because they came so became so focused on the externals and no longer did they look at the heart and Jesus rebuked them for that. So since the Bible doesn't say anything anywhere about our dress code during worship, I want you to see a verse that might be a little bit helpful. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in the, in the New Testament. It says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Now. I do try to dress nicely on Sundays because I don't want to be offensive to those who hold the opinion that we need to dress up. So I, I try to, you know, if my shirt needs ironing, I'll iron it. And, and, and I try to not be offensive because I respect and I want to honor those people who have that opinion. But I also dress casual too.